fantastic, terrific, great, all day long. Huh. Now, many of you who have been in, in any of my sessions may recognize that particular cheer. And I have to tell you that is not necessarily original. Back in 1985, I was exposed to a leadership philosophy that actually molded and changed my life. I participated in something called the American Youth Foundation's National Leadership Conference. And in that leadership conference, there were young people who came from all over the globe to understand this, this thing called leadership. As a teen in high school, I was a kid that was on the bubble. I could have gone either way. I could have been a, a positive leader or a negative leader. I was uh, what some would term at risk. And I'm not sure if the people who ran the program would recognize the impact that that particular experience had on me, both personally and professionally. They gave me a tool that became the north driving compass of my life, this motto that I've come to live by. And it was simply this phrase, my own self at my very best all the time. When you hear that, it, it sounds very quaint. But what I have found is that in that short phrase is a deep lifelong philosophy that is held true for me and, and offered lots of opportunities for me to live out my very best self. So my own self at my very best all the time. My own self, I am a person with purpose and power and I understand my ability to grow and my capacity to serve. My own self, I am a person who understands my limits. I understand my growth edges. I'm a critical thinker about my own behavior, which allows me to become critical and help others to think about their behaviors. I'm able to take the stick out of my eye before I point it out in someone else's. My own self. At my very best, what we recognize is that there are lots of things that we can measure ourselves against that are external to us. Capitalism requires that we look at the void and try to fill that with some kind of commercial thing. But what we know is that you can't buy anything that will fulfill or fill the hole in your soul. So when we talk about this idea of my own self at my very best, when I'm looking at my very best, I am comparing myself to myself because I know when I've done my best. Other people might not necessarily recognize what my best is, but I know what my best is. And so I strive to be my very best in every situation all the time. One of the things that we know is that the, the world is constantly changing. And so the world is begging for and asking for leaders who know how to adapt their leadership strategies to the complexities that this world is offering. And so when we talk about this idea of all the time, my own self at my very best all the time, that I am a leader in a number of different varieties, in a number of different settings, and a number of different places that I can be actionable in the world. I can be a leader in my home as a homemaker. I can be a leader in my job or my organization. And the most powerful leaders are those who can lead themselves. And so my own self at my very best has given me a way of looking at the world, a way of being actionable in the world that actually not only creates results for myself, but has allowed me to help others reach their goal. Servant leadership. I don't know about you, but that seems to be an oxymoron that maybe those two terms don't necessarily go together um, because don't servants take orders and don't leaders give orders? So how can one be a servant leader? So let's look at the American Revolution for one of our earliest examples, particularly in the United States, of servant leadership. When you think about the American Revolution, what person comes up for you? Traditionally, it's George Washington. And what image pops up in your mind? It's probably George Washington at the head of the ship with everyone behind him and he's, you know, pointing forward. Very powerful image. We need to talk about the character of George Washington. After leading these dissonance to a successful revolution, he was offered something that many of us may have bitten the bait. But George Washington was very clear about what his purpose was. 
George was given a very interesting proposition. They said, George, you did such a wonderful job leading our revolution. Would you like to be king? And George looked at the people and he was, he was very interested and intrigued by this, this idea because in his mind, he, he was thinking, didn't we just fight a war to get rid of a king? And now you want me to be king? Now, what might be appetizing about this offer of being king? Well, what are kings? Kings are absolute rulers. What they say goes. Everything is to their benefit as king. George Washington goes down in history as one of those great servant leaders because he understood some very simple principles. Leadership is not about how do you empower or gain things for yourself. He had the foresight to, to recognize that as we move forward, that this great country could be formed if we did things that weren't always about and for us. When we differentiate this idea of servant leadership versus positional leadership, what we recognize is that positional leadership is to, to gain power and influence for that position to get a particular thing done for that organization. But when we talk about servant leadership, what we talk about is that that position and that power is used to benefit other people. And so servant leadership becomes an important aspect of looking at how do we serve, particularly in government institutions. When we start talking about the government's responsibility, it is very much that of servant leadership. Servant leadership is both a leadership philosophy and a set of leadership practices. Traditional leadership generally involves the accumulation and the exercise of power by one at the top of a pyramid. By comparison, the servant leader shares power, puts the needs of others first, and helps people develop to perform as highly as possible. Here's something very interesting about power. So I go back to eighth grade science with Mr. Todd Klein. And one of the things that Mr. Klein taught us was that power was very specific. That power was simply the ability to do work. And so power could be good or evil. Uncle Ben Parker in Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. And I found that to be true. That in this particular society and in this context, there are certain things you need to have power. You need to have access to goods, jobs, services, and money. And when you have that, you have the ability to get things done in this particular society. And so power becomes very important. And how you use power will determine if you're using traditional methods of, of power or you're looking at this idea of servant leadership. In traditional uses of power, I seek to accumulate that power to establish and advance my own agenda. I use that power for me. When we talk about this idea of, of servant leadership, I'm gaining power so that I can disseminate that power to empower other people. And when that happens, I'm able to increase my power because I'm encouraging other people to use their power. Zig Ziglar once said that if you help people get what they want, they will help you get what you want. As we look at our organizations and we look at this idea of servant leadership, we find that the more people feel empowered in their workplaces, we're actually able to get more done. So how can we be both a servant and a leader at the same time? One of the things that we have to recognize is that power is the ability to get things done. And how we use that power is actually more important than the power that we have. When we use power to advance our own agendas, our own ideas, our own concepts, that has a limited lifespan. When we look at this idea of servant leadership, when I'm empowering others, when I'm gaining resources and, and knowledge to empower or give that power to other people, I'm actually multiplying my ability to be effective. An example, if we look at fruit trees, I find it interesting that fruit trees produce fruit not for themselves, but for others. 
And I would also say that if others can't consume the fruit, one might even ask the purpose of a fruit. I'll never forget being in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I was a young man, one of my first trips to, to Phoenix. And uh, many of you snowbirds will know what I'm talking about. But in, in Phoenix, they have all of these orange trees. And, uh, and so there, there's orange trees all over the place. And they fall from the trees and they're falling on the ground. Now, being a young man and, and having not experienced this, I started collecting fruits in my backpack. And so I, I saw these oranges and I, I started grabbing the oranges and putting them in my backpack. And then I, 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 when, when my backpack was full, I went back to the hotel and I, I kind of, you know, um, stashed them out and, and was ready for them to get ripe. And, uh, and so I crack open one of these, the, these oranges and it was a really thick peel, which I thought was odd, but I'm like, hey, these are free oranges and they, 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 they look great. So I crack open the, the, the peel, it's a really thick peel, and then I, um, I quarter the, the orange and I take, uh, it, with, with enthusiasm, I take a bite of the orange. <sighs> the orange was so nasty. It was just decoration. And so when we talk about servant leadership and we talk about traditional leadership, oftentimes traditional leadership has the trappings of, of, of being helpful, but can it be used by somebody else? So servant leadership is making sure that we have authentic fruit on our tree that can be used by other people. So when we're in conflict with folks, what are the things that we're thinking about? Are we thinking about ourselves or are we thinking about how do we advance this conversation to actually be helpful? Do we take offense to things as servant leaders, as people come to us with complaints or problems? Are they attacking me or is actually the problem the problem? Sometimes we get confused about this, this idea, this role of servant leader. We think that the, the, the degrees that we have, the certifications, the licenses that we have are actually for us, when in fact they're not. We get those things so we can help other people make better choices about their lives. So as a servant leader, um, I can't take things personally. While at the same time, I have to recognize that there needs to be a balance between my self-interest and my social interest. Self-interest says that I do need to take care of myself, that self-care is extremely important. I remember a, a story where um, uh, a young social worker came to me and she was very distraught. We were talking about um, disparities uh, with, with her clients and she was very upset and she she came crying and she said Andre my husband wants to go out for dinner and I don't know how I can go out to dinner with him when I have clients who don't have food to eat so I just smiled and I looked at her and I said ma'am go to dinner with your husband enjoy yourself because if you're not a full individual, you won't have anything to pour into your clients. And so b before we start pouring into other people, we have to make sure that our cups are full. And we have to be mindful of what our cups are full of. In 1984, I was driving a Honda Civic. And I don't know if you remember what cars were like in 1984, but they were missing one important thing, a cup holder. They didn't have cup holders. So you would have to go to a convenience store like a 7-Eleven or a Stop and Go and get one of these door hanger things and you put it on the door and then you put your soda in and every time you open the door, the thing would swing and you know just make a mess of, uh, of things. So the, the cars didn't have that. Um, it was also a standard transmission. So I had a, a Honda uh, Civic with a standard transmission. Standard transmission is the one with the stick, right? So to drive a standard transmission, you need your right hand, your left hand, and both feet. I had moved to, uh, I had moved to a, a new job about two blocks away because one of the things that I knew was that my 1984 Honda Civic would have problems in 1994. So I bought it in 1994, so it's already 10 years old. And what do you know about a car that's 10 years old? It is going to break down. As a safeguard, I said, oh, well, let me get close to work just in case I have to, have to walk. And at that point in time, uh, gas was about 79 cents a gallon. And I, I moved two blocks away from my, my office, so 
how do you think I got to work every day? I drove, right? The two blocks I drove. And, and since I was only two blocks away and I was driving to my office, um, what time do you think I left for my office? Five minutes ahead of time, right? And, and so uh, knowing that I'm leaving five minutes ahead of time, I, would, I knew I was going to be late, right? So I'm already in a hurry. Now, I was also addicted to this new thing called coffee. Back in 19, um, 1994, there were just a plethora of coffee shops everywhere, right? So I got addicted to coffee. Now, uh, th th we didn't have cup holders, so I had the swinging door thing, and uh, there weren't travel mugs. So how do you think I carried my coffee in a coffee mug? And since I was already late and I was addicted to coffee, I had to have coffee before I went to work. So I would grab my coffee mug, uh, fill it up with coffee, get in my car, and I'm late. So I'm already in a hurry and I'm driving a standard transmission car. So I have a coffee in one hand, I'm driving with another, I'm, I'm shifting with another, and my feet are going back and forth. And when I get to the office, somebody's in my unofficial parking space. So now I got to back up and, and maneuver. Now, while I'm doing all of this stuff, what is happening to my coffee? It's spilling. And why is my coffee spilling? And I will tell you, until I found this out, it kept happening until I discovered what the answer was. And so many of you will say, well, the coffee was spilled because you were in a hurry. Um, you weren't prepared. Your cup didn't have a... Um, a top on it. You didn't have a, uh, a, a a cup holder, right? And those were the same excuses that I gave myself as to why it kept happening until I realized the truth. That the reason that the coffee cup kept spilling, that the coffee kept spilling, the reason the coffee kept spilling was because that's what was in the cup. If I had water in the cup, what would have happened? Water would have spilled. And so for me, it became more important to recognize uh, what was in my cup than trying to problem solve all those other things. As servant leaders, it becomes important to recognize what we're full of because we will be in context that we can't control. We'll interact with people who are needy in some ways that we may or may not be able to be helpful with. But if we don't make it about us and we make it about making sure that they get what they need, when we spill, we can spill out the things that are necessary to help them. It's important that we do some self-care, that we balance what we're doing for others with making sure we know what we're full of. Servant leadership is about engaging people, empowering them to recognize the grandeur and the greatness of being human. And so what servant leadership says is that it's not just about me. It's not just about my job. I'm not here just for a nine to five, but I'm here to empower and offer people and remind them of the greatness of their humanity. So we talked a little bit about this idea of servant leadership, that as a servant leader, I'm actually using my position and my power to assist and better other people's lives. That my fruit is not for me, but is actually for other people. So I want to talk a little bit about this idea of power, because as a part of a servant leader, you are designing programs and opportunities to empower other people. So let's talk about this idea of power. So what is power? So as I've said before that Mr. Todd Klein shared with me in, in eighth grade that power was the ability to do work. So in our society, what do you need to have or possess power? So typically you need access to goods, jobs, services, and money. Those are social determinants that give you power. And so as a servant leader, what I'm doing is that I'm giving people opportunities to have access to goods, jobs, services, and money in whatever way that I can. And so as a servant leader, I am empowering people, giving them the ability to attain goods, jobs, services, and money directed towards their goals and their life. And so as a servant leader, that becomes extremely important that I not see myself as uh, accumulating power, but actually disseminating that power. And oddly and strangely enough, the more I empower other people, 
the more my power increases. And so power is extremely important. Another thing that's extremely important for a servant leader to recognize is what you're full of. What are you full of? In 1994, I was driving a 1984 Honda Civic. Now, what in the Honda Civic was missing in 1984 when they built the car? A cup holder. One of the most valuable resources in a car was missing in my 84 Honda Civic. And so I would have to go to a 7-Eleven stores and get one of those uh, clip on the door hanger kind of things. And you put your bottle in there and you forget about it and you open the door and it swing and splash and just make a total mess. Right. So there, there were no cup holders in cars in the 80s. 1994, I was addicted to coffee. I mean, there was a coffee explosion everywhere. It was the birth of, of the coffee houses. Right. Java was like raining from the heavens. And with that, I also didn't have a travel mug. So this 84 Honda Civic was a standard transmission car or commonly known as a stick. And, and I don't know if you've driven a stick or you've seen people drive stick or if you, you know, have a standard transmission car yourself, but you need both hands and both feet to operate this vehicle. At that same time, I had moved two blocks away from work because I knew one thing about my 84 Honda Civic that it could break down at any time. And so uh, being two blocks away from work, having this car and, and gas at the time was 87 cents a gallon. How do you think I got to work every day? That's right, I drove. Yes, I drove the two blocks. I'm an American, okay? And so driving those two blocks meant that I would leave at what time? Five minutes before I was supposed to be at work, which meant that I would always be late. And so I grab my, my grandmother's coffee mug, I fill it with, with coffee, I get in my uh, standard transmission car, try to navigate both hands on the wheel and on the pedals, and I'm running behind. And then I get to my office and someone has taken my unofficial permanent parking space. So I have to find another place. So now I'm, I'm jostling around and I'm, I'm late. And what is happening to my coffee? My coffee is spilling. And why do you think the coffee is spilling? Yeah, so it might be because uh, I don't have a cap on it, that I don't have a cup holder, that I, I'm in a hurry, that um, I'm being careless. I've got too much stuff going on and that's why the, 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 the coffee spilled. And I will tell you, until I found the real answer, I kept spilling my coffee. And so what's the real answer? Why was my coffee spilling? Because that's what was in the cup. If I had water in the cup, what would have spilled out? If I had juice in the cup, what would have spilled out under those circumstances? What's the object lesson of this? The, the, the idea is that whatever you're full of is what's going to spill out. So as a servant leader, you must be aware of what is it that you're full of. Because under times of stress and strain and, 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 and strife and struggle or not having enough resources or not having enough time, all of those things create this stressful situation and whatever spills out of you is what you've put in. You're driving down the, 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 the expressway and someone cuts you off. Whatever you do after they cut you off is what's inside of you. If you flip them the one finger gang sign, that's what was inside of you. If you're able to remove yourself a, a little bit from the situation and say, you know what, let them have their accident someplace else. So as servant leaders, we have to be mindful of what it is that we contain. And I have to tell you that if we don't pour it in, the universe will pour it in for us. So we have to be mindful of how we engage with the world. How do we replenish ourselves? How do we do that self-care? Because as servant leaders, you can't give what you don't have. We also must look at this idea of what are the tools of leadership that are at our disposal. Diversity is a tool of leadership. That this idea that we look at our differences and our commonalities is a tool that leaders, servant leaders use. 
So the definition that I like to use for, for diversity is that relationship between our differences and our commonalities. And too often, you know, we, we've had trainers come in, we've had consultants come in that focus on one of those things, but never both at the same time. And I would say that in any authentic trainer will have you look at both of those simultaneously because it is our commonalities and our differences that make us human and also make us effective in the workplace specifically as servant leaders. And so as a servant leader, if I need to be aware of what I'm full of, if I need to think about diversity as a tool of leadership, then I have to take into account these three concepts. The concept of bigotry, prejudice, and discrimination. So those have to be a part of my conscious awareness as a servant leader if I want to create opportunities for diversity to flourish in my organization and empowering the people who I work with. So let's look at this idea of, of bigotry. So what is bigotry? Now, when I think about bigotry, there's an image that, that comes up for me, and that is the image of Archie Bunker, America's favorite bigot. And his counterpart being George Jefferson, right? So, so these two characters are cut out of the same kind of mold. Archie Bunker and George Jefferson were both said to be kind of these curmudgeon -y kind of guys, right? So these hardworking uh, folks who had limited education and limited exposure, but were very opinionated. Now, the thing that I think is very interesting, particularly about Archie Bunker, was that there was a tagline attached to Archie Bunker, which was America's favorite bigot. Trying to watch those shows now, I'm amazed at what they were able to say and do on broadcast television. It was a phenomenon for a couple of reasons, and, and I'll tell you a, a little bit about those two right now. So the, the first reason was that there were people who saw Archie Bunker as a person who was telling the truth. He was telling America, this is how we are. This is the truth about us. So you speak, brother. But there was also a group of people who also saw Archie Bunker as a type of caricature of a long bygone period, an old way of, of thinking and interacting with the world. And so those two groups of people would come together to watch and, and share in the experience of this show. And it became a hit. I mean, Norman Lear was absolutely flabbergasted at how successful this particular show was. So that show was very profound in the American psyche. Why a bigot? Like, why are people drawn to that? And, and, and exactly what is a bigot? And many of you, like I, probably come to the conclusion that bigots suffer from a lack of information. That they are ignorant. And before I, I figured out how to work with the bigots, I made the same assumption. Looking at Archie Bunker, Archie had someone in his life that would constantly give him information. And I acted very much like this person, right? So um, Mike, his son-in-law, would give Archie information. And he'd say, no, Arch, that's not how it is. Here's some statistics. Here's some data. Here's some information. And how would Archie respond to Mike giving him some feedback? He would say, shut up, meathead, right? Because he said that Mike was dead from the neck up. He'd call him names or he'd make a joke or he would say some other things. And I, I actually found very similar things when I communicated with bigots. And so as we interacted with each other and as I watched the show, I finally heard and found the secret because in, in my own life, I would bring bigots information, data, statistics, and, um, and they would give me another reason. I'd give them more statistics and I'd give them more data. They give me more reasons why they, they, they feel like that until they got so frustrated, just like Archie, that they would tell me exactly what their problem was. And they would say, Andre, I don't care what you say. This is how I feel. Oh, bigotry is not about cognitive dissonance. It's an emotional state. That's why it doesn't make any sense how people feel because feelings don't make sense. So bigotry is an emotion. And so how do you change people's emotions or how do you help them change their emotions? You love them. Okay, no, no, I, I know. I know what you're saying. I know what you're thinking. I have to love a bigot. Yeah. 
So you, you have a friend that's sad, has the blues, not clinical depression, that's a whole nother thing, but, but just the blues. What do you do for that friend to cheer them up? Uh, some people might say, I take them out to the movies or we go get some, some chocolate cookies or uh, we, we go volunteer someplace, right? So you get them up and you get them moving. You, you listen to them. You comfort them. You sit with them. You love them. So people say that 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 fear and hate is the are are, are uh, pretty powerful um, emotions, and I would say that that may be may be true. But I will tell you that love is the most powerful. Love is the most powerful emotion, and that love conquers all, and it also covers all. I recall the thirty uh, five W uh, bridge collapse here in, uh, in, in Minneapolis. And there was, uh, so at the time I was working for uh, Anoka County and there was a, a, a picture of the 35W bridge collapse. And I remember that our, our emergency manager was talking about some of the events that he, he watched and he observed. And so th this picture is just of the vehicles, um, on the 35W, uh, bridge. And he, he, he was telling a story of how people were endangered themselves, leaving their cars to rush towards the school bus of children. Why? Because they had a love for those children that they did not know. So yeah, so 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 what I'm suggesting is that the kind of love I'm talking about isn't this romantic kind of love, but but it is about tethering yourself to people who you might think are different from you. Tethering yourself to them. Love them enough to say, I can't leave you in this situation. I can't leave you in this state of, of hatred. I'm going to tether myself to you so that you can see a way out. I find it interesting. I'm always I'm always fascinated by the number of bigots who understand what I do. So so I the, the way you see me here is the way I am out in the world, right? And they they they, they keep asking me questions, and I would get frustrated by that. I, I'd have people talk to me sideways, meaning uh, they would be disrespectful in a velvety kind of way, right? Um, that they would be sophisticated in how they would communicate, but the, the message was clear that I wasn't one of them or, or that we weren't equals. And I, and I kept asking myself, why are they drawn to me? Why do they keep asking me questions? Why, why do I have to keep dealing with this? And it occurred to me that moths are drawn to light. There's, there, there's something about me that they're saying, there's something about you that you could help me come out of my bigotry. And so sometimes we, we think that uh, people are being out of pocket and that it is all about us. But if I can get myself out the way, I can actually help somebody. And so when we talk about this idea of, of, of bigots, we have to tether ourselves to them. Now, this is why we don't like having bigots around us, uh, uh, us good people, right? We don't like having bigots around us because we are afraid that they might have a point. We're afraid that, that something that they will say will rub off on our children or rub off on, on us and we will be infected with that same kind of hatred or, or mistrust that they have. And so we got to get over ourselves and recognize that, that, that bigoted people, people who are frozen in this emotional state won't get better without us. Think about that uncle, that aunt that tells inappropriate jokes. If you're not in their life to tell them that those are inappropriate jokes, who will? And here's the scary part. They will find other people who share that same view and they will start to breed. So we got to tether ourselves. Now, now the, the, when we say tether, what I want you to, to recognize is that uh, tethers can be very long or they can be very short. I have two Great Danes and there are times when I can just let those dogs run. And then there are other times because of other people's behaviors, I got to keep those dogs close to me. 
And so what, what that looks like in, in, in practical terms is you say, Uncle Jim, you know, I really don't, I really don't like that language around my kids. I, uh, I'm going to pull you aside and we're going to talk about this. But Uncle Jim, I'm not letting you go. Uncle Jim, I'm going to keep inviting you to the family stuff and I'm going to keep telling you to be appropriate and I'm going to keep loving you and I'm going to keep engaging you because that's the only way that we can help bigoted people not be bigoted. And so the, the, the second concept that we have to recognize is this idea of prejudice. And we recognize that prejudice serves a purpose, right? So prejudice serves a purpose. It means to prejudge a situation. We talked a little bit about I implicit bias. Implicit bias is a form of prejudice. And, and so we need prejudice to kind of shorthand some of the things that we do. But when does prejudice become problematic? When we take it out of context. We talked a little bit about the six guys on the street and I'm, I'm 1130 at night. I'm walking down the street. There are six guys. And what decision do I make based on that context? I cross the street. And you and I both would suggest that what may be a good decision, a wise decision, a prudent decision. But what prejudiced people do is they take a good decision in one context and they take that good decision out of that context and try to apply it to every context. And so now I'm at the Mall of America and I see six people coming towards me. I use that same logic from the street. I cross into another aisle and what do I run into that aisle? Six more people. And so I keep using that logic and I, I, I can't get away. And I, 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 I seem somewhat confused. And so prejudice is this, this way of thinking. Now, how do you help someone change their thoughts? You don't. But you do ask questions. So one of my, my favorite shows growing up is this show, uh, Perry Mason. And Perry Mason, for, for the time, was um, a really sophisticated kind of uh, attorney, private eye kind of dude, right? Just really smooth and suave. And so uh, th this particular episode... Uh, Perry Mason being the, the top notch attorney that he was, he was going over his notes and looking at all of his, all of his stuff and um, came to the courtroom a little bit late. The proceedings had started. And so uh, the judge had just sat everyone down and they're, they're asking about where Perry is. And, uh, and, and Perry's assistant is like, you know, your honor, he'll be here shortly. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, all the attorneys are nervous because, you know, where is Perry? Right. And so Perry found something in the in the witness's testimony. He's like, I got it. So he uh, he, he comes into the courtroom and his theme music comes on. Da, 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 da. Right. And so Perry walks in and, and the hush falls over the 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 the, 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 uh, the courtroom. And people are like, oh, Perry's here. Perry's here. And so Perry nods to um to the other attorney and the other attorney kind of sneers at him. And, but, but Perry just goes on. He nods to the judge and, and the judge smiles and he was like, all right, take your seat, Perry. And so Perry takes a seat. And so the, uh, the, uh, the uh, defense attorney is, is uh, well, the other attorney is, is doing his thing, right? So he's examining the witness and, and so forth. And he says, you know, um, I like to, to um, just do my thing. And so Perry, uh, you know, raises his hand and said, judge, may I approach the, the witness? And, um, and the judge says, yes. And so the crowd is like, Ooh, here it comes. And so Perry walks up to, to the witness and he says on the night in question, is it true that you, right? So he just says all this stuff. And then the, um, and then the, the, uh, the, the witness is like, how did you know that? And he's like, I didn't tell anybody that. And then the other attorney is like, you know, judge, we don't want this as a part of the record. You know, uh, judge, can you, can you, you know, strike that from the record? And, um, you know, I object, the other attorney says. And so, uh, so, so, so Perry is, is standing there and the, the crowd is like, ah, and people, and the judge is like, order in the court, order in the court. And he, he calms everything down and he says, objection sustained. And Perry says, I withdraw the question. Wait a minute. Perry's a top notch attorney. 
Why would Perry go through all of this stuff only to take the question back? Because he accomplished his goal. What did Perry want by asking that question for the jury to think? So how do you help a prejudiced person? A person that's frozen in their thought process? You get them to think. Mom, dad, are are there other news, cable news stations that might suggest that there's another way to look at this, right? So uh, Uncle Bob, how did you come up with that particular way of of thinking? Oh, um, um, Aunt Aunt, uh, Aunt Aunt Jane, how did you? Uh, what what book did you read that from? Uh, what articles are you getting those things from? You start asking prejudiced people questions about where they get their information, and it's like real Will Robinson in that that robot from Lost in Space, right? Danger, Will Robinson, danger! It is almost as if they start to shut down, like they're they they don't know what to do with that stuff because all too often we're, we're operating off of paradigms that we've been given as opposed to actual information. That that we know ourselves. So how do you, as a servant leader, how do you help people? First, you, you recognize that bigotry is an emotional state. And so you, you care for those people. You tether yourself to them until we can get change. Um, prejudice. Recognize that prejudice is a thought pattern, uh, a thought process. And the only way to, to change a thought process is to have people to critically think. And then lastly, it's this idea of discrimination and discrimination is the the sum total of thoughts and um, and emotions. It is the action. So discrimination is an action. And in 1964, the Civil Rights Act did two powerful things. First, it outlawed segregation, that whole idea of separate but equal. Right. It outlawed that. So so that's out the window. But it also gave a definition of discrimination. It gave it gave some legal handles on how to deal with discrimination. So 1964. We have the legal framework for discrimination, which means that discrimination was over. Right. No, it's not over. Why? So I go to um, this this philosophy um, that happens in social work and in education called uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy. Cognitive Behavior Therapy. What Cognitive Behavior Therapy suggests is that emotions plus our thoughts dictate our behaviors. Have you ever heard a kid say, well, I don't feel like it, right? You want to do this thing? No, I don't feel like it, right? So that's part of that cognitive behavior therapy, right? So emotions plus thoughts dictate behaviors. So the federal government said that we will take care of people's behavior. So discrimination is taken care of by the federal government, right? So you walk down the hall at work and a, a coworker grabs you on your rear end. What do you have? Sexual harassment. What happens? The, the law engages at that point, right? So you go to H, you file an HR complaint or report or, or whatever. You go down that, that path. And if you don't like that, there are civil um, courts that you can, you can you get an attorney and you go down that, that, that path. And, and what if during that whole thing, the person says, you know, I was just joking. Um, you can't take a joke, you know, blah, blah, blah. Does that stop the process? It doesn't, right? Because it is about the behavior and not the intent. And so discrimination is about people's behavior. So the federal government said that we'll take care of that. So what's left? Well, if we look at cognitive behavior therapy, it says that emotions plus thoughts dictate behaviors. Well, the law said it will take care of our behaviors. So whose job is it to take care of thoughts and emotions? It's ours. Why do we still have discrimination today? Because as servant leaders, we haven't taken charge of making sure that we check people on their their emotional state, that we tether ourselves to them. And we've also not challenged people to think critically about the world that we live in. And so we have discrimination. 
So how do we how do we undo this? So as servant leaders, what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to make sure that our policies, our our practices, and our procedures are are open for all folks to join in this work of not only being human, but participating in a government where they pay taxes. It's our responsibility as as servant leaders to garner those resources to the betterment of other people and not just to ourselves. So as servant leaders, it's important that we build relationships, we build coalitions, not only for ourselves, but for our organizations.